it's eight o'clock, so we'll get started um, with Grand Rounds. Uh, and uh, I, I love having the residents here, the cluster in the back. Um, you guys stick together. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. We're very delighted to have our uh, special outside speaker uh, here for the SCORE program um, in uh, Hemong. Uh, and to and as a reminder, after Grand Rounds, we have another half hour session of informal discussion. Um, so anybody is welcome to come and stay for additional Q&A and conversations with Dr. Moses. So to introduce our guest speaker today, I will hand over the mic to Dr. Joshua Lang in our division of Hemonc and our vice chair for research. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. It is my incredible honor to introduce Dr. Calvin Moses. Dr. Moses completed his undergraduate training at Morehouse University. Um, this was then followed by graduate in medical training at Baylor followed by a urology uh, residency at Emory. He then went to Memorial Sloan Kettering as a urologic fellow and has um, had a few different stops along the way in his journey, uh, developing uh, really a fantastic and amazing platform and understanding health literacy, health services research, access to care, and with a focus on prostate cancer. Um, Dr. Moses is an internationally recognized expert in this space and I want to share a couple of personal anecdotes. You know, I, I first met uh, Kelvin actually at ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting. I was the discussant for the posters and he was one of the presenters. And this was a, in an audience with thousands of people in the audience. And at one point in his talk, if you don't mind me sharing, Kelvin, um, he just paused when he was talking about access to care and said, you know what, if you are voting against um, uh, voting against or not voting for candidates who support the Affordable Care Act, you are voting against your patients. And can I tell you, standing applause. Like everyone, everyone was so thrilled and emboldened by that, uh, that statement. I then reconnected with Calvin a couple years later, actually, when someone, a patient in Milwaukee, a black man with metastatic prostate cancer, reached out to him and said, I need help. And can you connect me with someone who's a specialist? And he connect, we connected and we were able to bring the patient here to UW and find ways to really help and understand what was happening for this gentleman. So again, in terms of improving access to care for patients who need it. So with that, I am incredibly honored to introduce Dr. Moses, who's gonna be talking about trends and screening diagnosis of prostate cancer. Kelly. All right, can everybody hear me? Is the volume? Okay, great. So thanks so much. It's really an honor to be here. It's my first time in Madison. Uh, I'm really here for the World Dairy Expo. This is uh, it's a sort of a side side trip here, but uh, me and Bessie are having a great time. Uh, so we'll get started here. I think do I have to stop on this slide or okay uh, disclosure. So so I'll talk about uh, screening, diagnosis, and treatment of prostate cancer. So this will be a talk in three parts, and I strategically put it in this order because I want everybody to be calm and relaxed by the time we get to the end. Um, these are my disclosures. I am on the, the uh, actually I'm the chair now for the NCCM panel on early detection. So I, I do have a little bit of um, uh, skin in the game on this. So I'll talk about contemporaneous data on screening and, and I'm, I'm not here to proselytize, but I am here to sort of give data to what I believe in. Um, and then I'll talk about biomarkers and really how we've refined our, our diagnosis and, and risk stratification for prostate cancer. And then I'll talk about treatment for high risk disease. I, I actually purposely left off low risk. Um, we can talk about active surveillance later, uh, but I really wanted to talk about the men with, with disease that could truly uh, have problems. All right, so don't, don't throw anything, okay? <laughs> All right, so everybody knows prostate cancer is uh, the most commonly diagnosed uh, non-cutaneous malignancy in men in the United States and the second most common cause of cancer death. Um, here are the cancer trends. Everybody's probably familiar with this scale. We as urologists are very proud of this decline over time because we feel that that PSA screening um, was a part of this. Uh, but we're concerned about this flattening, and that happens right about 2012. And again, I'll talk a little bit about why we think that's happening and, and what we can possibly do to reverse that trend. Uh, 
it is a highly prevalent disease. So one in eight men uh, will be diagnosed with cancer. As we know though, probably less than 10% actually die of prostate cancer. So we have to be very um, uh, uh, selective about who we're moving on through the continuum of care for prostate cancer. All right, so again, I'm preaching to the choir here. What is a good screening test, right? Every good medicine resident knows when to order a specific test and why the negative predictive value, right? So at least for a cancer screening, a good test means that it is a serious disease, that treating it before symptoms occur is beneficial uh, and better than waiting until symptoms arrive. And the pr prevalence is high enough that it merits both uh, uh, in a clinical care setting, but even economically, uh, that screening for it has a significant impact. Then the test should also be relatively cheap, relatively easy to administer, should not basically inconvenience the patient so much that it's not applicable in a general population. And it should be a valid test, right? So validity is a part of it. And that's the problem with PSA, right? So there is no positive PSA. You know, we've arbitrarily set it at three or four, whatever number you pick. But even worse, there's really no negative test. I've had men with a PSA of 0.7 that have had raging cancer, and it just depends on what kind they have. You can have elevation in non-malignant settings. Not all cancers will be symptomatic or fatal. And most importantly, or most concerning then, is that PSA testing became widespread before randomized trial determined efficacy. And so those of us who've had a little few more birthdays, remember PSA was actually never meant as a screening test, right? It was meant for those who have prostate cancer and determining you know, how, how bad it is, but it was really never meant to be a screening test. So harms of screening, overdiagnosis. So most men, as I said, will die with prostate cancer, but not necessarily of it, okay? And we really don't have a, a way of predicting reliably fatal disease. Again, I'll talk about some of the tissue and serum biomarkers that maybe give us some indication. Uh, but importantly, when the USPSCF made their first recommendation about PSA screening back in 2012, uh, they did not review any of the biomarker testing. They did not review any of the refinements of PSA testing. They also didn't take into account the increasing utilization of active surveillance for low-risk disease. Um, <clears throat> there is overtreatment, and that is our fault. We, as urologists, did way too many surgeries. Uh, my, my former chair, in his, uh, he's given sort of an overview of his career talk, and he said, you know, I used to be proud of the fact that I did 15,000 prostatectomies in my lifetime. He says, now I'm kind of ashamed of it because that means that I did way too many. Um, and so we recognize now that a lot of men uh, receive harm uh, from treatment who most of them might not have necessarily needed to do that. And we know about the common complications, most commonly erectile function, urinary incontinence. And so these are the harms that can occur. And so in that setting, uh, with the sort of controversy around screening, is it beneficial or not? Uh, in the early to mid 2000s, we had two large randomized trials, one in Europe, uh, the European Randomized Study, ERSPC, and in the U.S. was the PLCO trial. So in 2009, the ERSPS, uh, ERSPC uh, reported out 182,000 men in seven countries. Their PSA screening uh, trend was every two to four years versus no screening, and the outcome was prostate cancer-specific mortality, and you can see the curve here. Uh, their follow-up was nine years, and as we know, the lifespan of prostate cancer is much longer, so anything that reports out less than really 15 or 20 years is probably a little too early. So they reported out at nine years. They did see a significant difference uh, with a, um, a risk of death reduced by 20%, but they found that you needed to screen over 1,400 patients and diagnose over 48 to save one life. So that's a, that's a pretty big number that's needed to screen. And so that was their conclusion. You could reduce risk of death by 20%, but it is associated with a high risk of overdiagnosis, okay? And then there was the PLCO trial, so 76,000 men, and it was annual screening and DRE versus usual care. And uh, that, was, that ended up being a very controversial thing, but it was not 
no screening. So it was not a pure screening versus no screening trial. And so they looked at incidents, deaths, and prostate cancer specific deaths. And not too surprisingly, they're, they're, uh, at seven years, they didn't see a difference. Um, and even at 10 years, it was a non-significant difference. Um, but there, again, there were some problems with it, but their conclusion at seven to 10 years follow-up, difference is low and not significant between the two groups. Now, of course, urologists and radiation oncologists and everybody that gets paid from prostate cancer went in and started uh, dissecting the paper. But um, a true uh, uh, critique, though, is that at least 50% of the men got a PSA during the study in the control group, and uh, up to 44% had PSAs before entering the study. And in subsequent analyses, it showed that up to 90% of men in the control group at some point got a PSA. So when you compare an apple to an apple, you get an apple, right? So, um, but regardless, so both of those papers, they were published, I think in the same issue of, of New England Journal. Um, and so USPSTF got together and they said there's moderate certainty that the benefits do not outweigh the harms. They gave PSA screening. In 2010, they gave a D grade for men 75 and older. And then in 2012, a D grade for everyone. They recommended against screening. Um, and there was an immediate drop off, right? It, you know, it, when I was in medical school, I was told that it takes about, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 years for a paradigm to change in medicine. Well, not with PSA screening. It was it dropped like a lead balloon. And predictably, there was some uh, reaction. Okay, so um, that's, that's not me at the top. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and, and it was, there were, and actually the first three words of the AUA's response was, we are outraged. Um, and actually it was my chair that said that. Uh, but it was, it was, it was, there was sort of a, a, a big deal. And, uh, patient advocacy groups kind of came out and said, you know, what about us? Um, the primary care docs were like, hey, we got a screen for cholesterol and blood pressure and colon cancer and breast cancer and diabetes and yeah, PSA, gone. So um, what happened? So uh, Dan Barocas, who who's at my center, uh, did a study looking at um, basically uh, uh, the trends and incidents over time. So starting in 2010, that top line, so the, the orange line here is low risk cancer, the red is intermediate risk, and the blue is high risk cancers. And so you can, and it, it's normalized against colon cancer uh, incidents here. And so as you can see, that top line dropped down. So we diagnosed fewer lower, low risk cancers. Good, right? Like that's what, that's what we wanted to do. But you also see a big drop off in intermediate high risk. And so we were diagnosing fewer high grade cancers. And that means we're probably missing cancers that, that could cause problems. And as, as I, in, in the black community, we, we always say when, when America catches a cold, we catch the flu. So what happened? PSA screening rates actually declined faster among black men and particularly in younger black population. It declined 11% in black men, a little over 9% in white men. And uh, the incidence ratio for black men actually widened. So men, black men already got screened at a lower rate, were already diagnosed with higher grade cancers. And now the, the gap in the type of cancer being diagnosed widened. The incidence of metastasis increased in both groups. Um, and that's because uh, again, over time we, we saw when we were getting men in for biopsy, uh, the risk, uh, relative risk of being diagnosed with high risk disease increased by 25%. So there was a, there was a reaction to this. this. This paper came out in 2015. It was a little early, but it was what we, we figured that that was a problematic trend. So the Europeans came back and they, they published in 2015 their 13 year follow up. And as you can see, this is where they reported out initially. So that was that 20% gap. And now at 13 years, you actually see a widening of the gap. And now at 20 years, it's, it's even further. And so you, that's what we figured would happen. Uh, and the data shows that. So now the, the um, number needed to screen has dropped almost by half. And the number needed to diagnose has dropped by two thirds. And so now the, the, the ratio of screen men it, it has improved to 0.73. Uh, 
The other thing that uh, the Europeans saw was that there was a dramatic decrease in the diagnosis of metastatic disease over time and uh, preceding mortality reduction by three years. And, and so, again, we said early on when they published at seven years, survival was not the correct endpoint. It should have been uh, either symptoms or metastatic disease because that's what men live with. Meta people with metastatic disease can live five, eight, 10 years. And so that's where the burden of disease really lies. So the guidelines have adjusted somewhat. A part of the confusion too is that every guidelines panel is a little bit different. Uh, the AUA, uh, but th so the, the common link is shared decision-making. So having that discussion with patients. And so uh, the AUA recommends shared decision-making from age 55 to 69, and that's based on ERSPC data. And then select younger men, either with positive family history or in black men. And then they say for some men older than 70 in excellent health, uh, you can continue screening, again, uh, weighing the benefit versus the risk. NCCN, again, as I said, in my uh, conflicts or disclosures, uh, we, we just met last week. Um, so we're sticking with a shared decision making from 45 to 75. Um, part of the reason, there's two reasons why we left it at 75. Number one, um, the, the men who are diagnosed with cancer older than 78 tend to die from prostate cancer, and it tends to be very high-grade disease. So we left it in. The second reason is, uh, and this goes no further than this room, but and uh, that goes for you too on the camera, um, there's, there's a couple of men on our panel who every time they get on every year, they're a year older, and they're like, oh, yeah, we should definitely go to 80 because... <laughs> So that, that's not true, but it, it's true. Um, so we left it at, and then again, select very healthy, the marathon runners who are still running. Uh, and then USPSTF did upgrade it just a little bit to a C grade. Um, again, in men in reasonable health, you can discuss risk and benefits if they wish to consider. And so th that's, that's my screening you know, talk, really. But the, the emphasis really should be who is at risk assessing the patient, screening smarter, right? We should screen smarter, not harder, okay? And so, and then we as the treating physicians have to treat smarter and not harder. So again, we, we've increased our rates of active surveillance. We've increased uh, uh, biomarkers and that's the next part of the talk. But really we want to uh, be data-driven, right? Like it, we have to sort of get our emotions and feelings and sort of biases about it and really follow what the data is telling us. So I'm going to pivot a little bit, but it'll, it'll feed back into what we've been talking about, a little bit on um, biomarkers and genetic testing. So again, what, what is a good biomarker test, right? So again, easily obtainable, easily measurable, improves specificity and sensitivity, certainly much more than PSA alone. Again, relatively cheap. I, they're not all cheap. They will be eventually, but as people sort of jockey for who's the best test, um, right now they're still paying off their... Um, you know, round B funding. Um, it should improve not only diagnosis, but risk stratification and predict risk of progression, right? Because again, we want to know if we treat this man at 65 and he lives to 80, are we going to prevent him from recurrence or symptoms from disease? And then the other thing, and, and really importantly, is we need to reduce the number of biopsies we do. Um, uh, if you ever taking care of a septic patient after a biopsy, it can be dramatic. I've had patients die after a biopsy. So you really want to be smart about who we're biopsying. And there are some other biopsy techniques that I'll talk about and we can uh, discuss after the, after the session. So PSA alone is a poor test. Again, it was never meant as a screening test and, and just as a raw number using four as a cutoff. Uh, it only has a specificity of 12.8%. So that's, that's abysmal, right? So that, that alone should make you want to throw it out, right? Um, if you use percent free PSA, if you use 25% as a threshold, it does improve sensitivity to 95%. So those low, uh, 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 slightly elevated PSA, but a high percent free, that gives you a little bit more confidence. And so you can actually avoid 20% of biopsies using that threshold in men with a PSA of 2 to 10 um, in Swedish men, and the reason I do that is because the data comes from Sweden, which is a very 
homogeneous society with a great national health system with great preventive care. But among those men, a PSA of one, a baseline PSA of one in their 60s actually predicts risk of prostate cancer death. So in Sweden, if a man in his 60s has a PSA of like 0.5, they actually don't screen anymore. They say, you will not die of prostate cancer. Uh, but for those where it's higher, then they will continue to follow up. Um, the data, you know, we, we've used PSA density of 0.15 as a cutoff, PSA velocity of two. That's sort of mixed. I mean, some of us use that, but it, it's probably not, again, not the best test. So here are the, this is just the list of the, the current FDA approved biomarkers. There are serum-based tests, 4K and PHI, and urine-based tests, and we'll, we'll go over these a little bit. So 4K um, is based on the, the four human calocrines. And um, this, was, this came out of uh, some of the investigators at Memorial where I train. Uh, but then they also incorporate uh, age, DRE result, prior biopsy results. And so you get a readout of, of all the different uh, uh, proteins. And then they send you this, this graph, right? And so um, the area on the curve of 0.82 uh, versus 0.74 for PSA. And so if you use a cutoff of 9%, you can, add, you can avoid 43% of biopsies with only missing 2% of higher grade disease. And you can actually see here uh, on this scale, they actually use 7.5 as the cutoff. So a lot of places will use uh, 4K upfront. And if you're on the fence and you come back in that green zone, we'll actually avoid a biopsy and that man and just continue to follow uh, their PSAs. Uh, the other one, uh, PHI, so this is actually a mathematical calculation. Again, taking uh, the, the pro-PSA segment of the protein, um, and it's for use of men uh, in that sort of mid-range PSA of 4 to 10. Um, overall, the, the AUC is only 0.7, but if you use a cutoff of, point tw of 24, it actually rises to 0.8. And again, you can avoid 41% of biopsies, and reduce overdiagnosis by almost 20%. So um, that's actually pretty good, right? And you have not, if you set the, set the um, cutoff at 28.6, 30% of men with quote unquote elevated PSA can avoid a biopsy. So that's a, that's a pretty good reduction. Almost a third of men can avoid a biopsy. So um, a useful test. Uh, this is a urine based test, PCA3. Um, this is a post-DRE urine sample, and you're checking M mRNA. Um, and if you set it at 35, um, you can uh, predict, uh, for people who've had a, a, a biopsy before, you can increase the, the uh, predictability of, of detecting a significant cancer at 39%. And uh, if you, the, for the mean PCA3, um, the uh, odds of, of uh, getting a positive biopsy is 69 69 versus 31 for negative biopsy. Um, so you do, there are some cancers missed with this test. And I, I actually, not a ton of people use PCA3 anymore. Plus a lot of men aren't super excited about the prostate massage. Um, some are, some aren't, but it's, uh, it takes a little bit of conversation, shared decision-making. Um, so, because PCA3 is not actually a great test on its own, they do suggest um, using it in combination with other variables. Uh, but the, in the EAU, the, the European Urology Guidelines, they do uh, use PCA after prior negative biopsy in men with a PSA of two to 10. Um, I'm gonna get into it later, but all of these are given sort of agnostic of MRI, which has sort of changed the game as far as, as diagnosis. So um, these, these, these are, are not given as far as imaging. Uh, the MIPS or MPS is the temperous ERG fusion protein, uh, which can be detected in up to 50% of cancers in a post-DRE urine sample. Um, the error in the curve for this is 0.77 versus PSA. A couple of problems with that, that error in the curve doesn't meet some of the other tests. As I said, those were like 0 0.8, 0 0.85. Uh, the temperous ERG is also actually very uncommon in black men. So again, if you're talking about a higher risk group, and uh, the test probably is not valid uh, in that population. So uh, another one, select MDX is actually a pretty interesting one. Again, a post-DRE urine sample, uh, but it looks at specific genes, DLX1 and HOXC6. Uh, and in combination with total PSA, age, prior biopsy, and family history, the AUC for this is 0.9. Uh, 
So this one is actually a, a very good test and a lot of physicians out in the community are using this. Um, and uh, so it says total reduction of biopsy 42%, but then for men with low, uh, what would end up being low risk disease or none, it actually reduces by 53%. Uh, so that's actually a very good test. Another test that a lot of uh, are using a tissue-based test is confirmed EX. And this is particularly good for men who've been diagnosed with low risk disease who you're considering for active surveillance. And there's, again, there's somewhat on the fence. Their PSA may be six or seven. They may be really young and you're wondering, am I gonna keep this guy on surveillance for 20 something years? So this looks at hypermethylation of CPG islands in the, uh, the area around the tumor. Uh, and it's looking at these particular genes. And the negative predictive value for this uh, approach is 90%. And so again, this is, this is something that's useful uh, for men who are, who are you're trying to put on surveillance. And then again, another one uh, that we use for, for uh, 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 surveillance is the Polaris test. This is a 46 gene panel um, uh, and used on, on, um, on biopsy tissue. And again, it helps in the, if the score is greater than one, you can see a drop in the um, uh, biochemical recurrence um, uh, freedom. And so uh, we also use it after surgery. So when you have the, 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 the whole prostate, you can actually use it for deciding which men need adjuvant therapy. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the sport talk at noon if you're free. Um, but adjuvant radiation, again, does not come without risks, uh, particularly in a post-operative patient. And so if we can risk stratify which patients we can watch safely versus go ahead and treat adjuvantly versus salvage, uh, this is a helpful test. Another one that's used, and, and particularly in the post-operative setting, is ultra-sensitive PSA. A lot of practices are using this even in the, in the sort of screening er um, area, but this is for men, again, who've had surgery, have some high-risk features, do we treat adjuvantly? So in men who are PT3-4, uh, negative nodes, agnostic of margin, if that first post-op PSA, uh, ultra-sensitive PSA is greater than 0.03, uh, they uh, have eight times the risk of biochemical recurrence. And so those men will actually go ahead and, and treat. Um, and then any post-op PSA um, greater than 0.03, um, is associated with a biochemical recurrence free rate of 65 versus 10% uh, for lower. Um, and so that, this is actually a very good test. It's a little bit expensive. It's not available everywhere. Um, but it does give you a lead time advantage. So um, you can salvage patients earlier. So in, in the surgery realm, we consider failure a PSA of 0 0.2 or higher. And uh, at our center, we, that's our level of detection. And so uh, we may be losing time in men whose PSA is actually going up, but we're saying, well, it's still undetectable. So you might have an 18-month lead time, and you can salvage patients earlier and, and still aim for cure in those men. Um, however, in men who have had an ultra-sensitive PSA that is undetectable two years after, uh, they're very unlikely to develop uh, PSA or recurrence. And so again, you can de-escalate that uh, the, the burden of coming in and getting your PSAs or that worry about the PSA and say, hey man, at two years, your, ultrasound, your PSA is still 0.03, you're in good shape. Uh, there's some other tests. Decipher uh, is a 22 RNA biomarker, uh, can predict uh, risk of metastasis. Uh, the Prolaris test, uh, again, helps in uh, uh, decision-making. Uh, there's ExoDX. It uses uh, the Tempris ERG, PCA3, um, and SPDEF. Again, this is a post-DRE, but it can help differentiate Gleason 6 from Gleason 7 with a pretty high negative predictive value. Stockholm 3, uh, coming out of Sweden, this is, they are going for FDA approval now in the United States, but they use several var variables, genetic polymorphisms. Um, and again, in Europe, this is the reflex test for men with that PSA of like two to 10. Uh, and then there's other uh, uh, trials that are going on uh, for other biomarkers. So again, as, as people are jockeying for who's the best test, cost is still relatively high uh, and utility is somewhat mixed, but you, know, you pick your favorite test and, and you use that. 
so as I mentioned before, a lot of these studies are done in very specific populations. It was done only in Sweden or only at Hopkins or wherever. And, and again, there's not really a lot of prospect of randomized trials. And it, again, if we're going to be data driven, if we're going to give category one uh, approval for something, we need to know that. Um, there's minimal to no participation of black men in a lot of these trials. Um, and so again, the highest risk population, the highest risk of death for prostate cancer, but not involved in the trials, that, that needs to change. And then I mentioned before, with improved imaging, multiparametric MRI, PSMA PET scan, we, we've really changed the paradigm of how we're risk stratifying and diagnosing men and there's really now a push for using MRI for diagnosis. If you can't see a tumor, then there's no point of even checking a PSA or a biopsy or anything. We're not quite there yet, but th that's where the push is. Um, and then I mentioned cost again. This, this isn't my financial toxicity talk, uh, but it's not insignificant, these costs. And so we, th when you talk about cost versus value, Number one, you need to define value, define quality, but where, where do we reach that balance? So I mentioned MRI, and this, this is what it looks like. So in T2 imaging in the peripheral zone, you'll see, uh, I don't have a pointer, uh, but you can see that dropout of signal here. So in this case, we use this for a lot of reasons. Number one, is there cancer? There's the PIRAT scale from one to five. And at our center, we use three to five for uh, a trigger for biopsy. Um, but also when we're planning for surgery, we can look at the capsule. So is there extra capsular extension? If we're planning for nerve sparing surgery, we can actually see the nerve bundles. That's where the arrow is. You can see the nerve bundles right there. We can also see if there are anterior tumors. So if we're doing a targeting biopsy, um, we, can, we can aim our needle further in to get that anterior sampling. So only about 25% of cancers are found in that anterior zone, but there is some data that suggests maybe in black men, uh, there may be a higher preponderance of tumors that are basically in that fibrostroma in the anterior part of the prostate. Our radiation oncology colleagues will also use MRI uh, looking at the thickness of the rectal wall and closeness. Um, we do have the, the, the spacer gel that we can um, inject in that area. Radiologists will, will ask for it, but then if you ask them, uh, did it help with, with symptoms, it's, it's kind of mixed. So um, that remains to be seen. Um, and then the other thing we use MRI for are uh, targeted biopsies. So right now, when we do a biopsy, it's an ultrasound probe. Uh, we can get a picture. We can see where to inject our numbing medicine. And then we're doing what are called sextant biopsies. So right and left prostate, base, mid, apex, and then two in each area in the peripheral zone. And even though we call it systematic, it's completely a stab in the dark, right? Like we're, the ultrasound really, you can't really tell where a tumor is. And it's just like trying to find the worm in the apple. If you stab it a couple of times, you might skive it or you might miss it, but it doesn't mean the worm isn't there. And so uh, what we have, there's two different systems. Um, uh, uh, oh, I, that's what you blanked out. <laughs> so we have uh, what's called Artemis and Euronav. But so a man gets an MRI, then he comes up to the ultrasound suite and they, with a, a computer software, they can fuse the live ultrasound image with the MRI. And then um, the uh, radiologist has uh, identified the region of interest and then the machine actually targets it. So you just have to get the machine docked and it will target those specific areas. And so some sensors are actually only biopsying region of interest now, not even doing the systematic biopsy. Um, all of the studies so far have used uh, targeted biopsy with systematic just to make sure that we aren't missing other cancers or to detect, detect the rate of insignificant cancers. But again, we're moving more towards just doing those targeted biopsies. So instead of getting 12 to 14 sticks, you only get two or three, and that reduces uh, the potential for pain, infection, bleeding, et cetera. So just to wrap up this, this section, so um, right now, as far as we have for screening is PSA and DRE. Don't forget the DRE. I know, again, in medicine clinic, that's not always a favorite thing. I actually, when I, my uh, first couple of years in practice, I was at our county hospital and the family medicine residents rotate with me. And uh, we had a, a patient come in uh, for concern uh, with elevated PSA. And so 
um, the first thing he said was, well, we don't screen for prostate cancer. I was like, do you know who you're talking to, first yeah. of all? And then I said, okay, so we had a, a data talk and I don't think I convinced him, but uh, so but he, then he was like, well, we certainly do, don't do DRE. DRE is, again, it's not the most sensitive test. It's not the most specific test, but it does provide information. It gives you size of prostate. So if someone comes in with that slightly elevated PSA where they have a huge prostate, it's probably from the prostate, right? Uh, it can tell you if there's nodule, but again, you can tell there's extra capsular extension and I've diagnosed rectal cancers doing it. Um, so it, it's, there's still some value. Um, at the biopsy or monitor stage, we have the 4K, MIPS, PHI, and select MDX. Um, for men who've had a negative biopsy, but you still have concern, uh, there's confirmed uh, MDX and PCA3. Um, again, for men, we're trying to decide on active surveillance. You can use 4K, Oncotype, or Polaris. And then lastly, here for men who are following after treatment for risk stratification, you can use Decipher, Polaris, or ultra-sensitive uh, PSA. Marco Rubio moment. All right, so I'm gonna switch to uh, high risk disease. So historically for high risk localized disease, most of these men either got androgen deprivation alone or radiation plus or minus androgen deprivation. And the, the thought was, oof, I didn't do that. Uh, with surgery, you know, you might leave positive margins. There is risk associated with, sur with surgery. And particularly with high-risk disease, you're probably going to have to resect the, 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 um, the nerves. And so almost all these men uh, end up not with erections. Um, and then you're concerned about, uh, I'm on a timer now somehow, um, uh, uh, recurrence of disease. So here's the current NCCN guidelines. Uh, I'm on a play here. Let me see. Or maybe it's not. Okay. Um, so uh, for men with reasonable uh, survival, the, the top recommendation is for EBRT with androgen deprivation, ideally one and a half to three years, if you can get them that far, uh, plus or minus dose of taxa for the very high risk group. Uh, you can do combination EBRT brachytherapy with ADT, uh, but we do include surgery. Um, and um, I'll go a little bit into how we should do that surgery. Uh, but for a lot of these men, we'll still get adjuvant therapy. I don't know how to stop this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk faster. Um, so, but there is some rationale for surgery. So if you look at SEER data from about 15, 20 years ago, if you looked at men with metastatic disease who were diagnosed within three years of having had a prostatectomy, live longer than men with metastatic disease who had not had surgery before. So that was the first signal that maybe controlling the primary has some benefit um, uh, for survival. You can get good long-term cancer-specific survival with surgery, good local control. And, and some of these men you know, with really advanced cancers come in with hematuria, obstruction, pain. Um, and then you can get accurate staging. So you can upstage people, you can downstage. A lot of men who come in with these Gleason 8, 9, 10s, actually when you get the whole prostate, it turns out it was a Gleason 7. So again, so with surgery is part of it, but we also should include uh, pelvic lymph node dissection. There is a lot of controversy in this, uh, whether we do pelvic lymph node dissection or not, do the risk of pelvic lymph node dissection outweigh the benefit. Uh, but at least for the NCCN guidelines, they prefer an extended pelvic lymph node dissection. So that means going up to the common iliacs, going laterally to the genofemoral nerve, all the way down to the base of the pelvis. Um, and so we, uh, at least in, in my practice and, and most surgeons, uh, a risk of uh, greater than 2% on any of the 100 nomograms that are available of lymph node metastasis, we will include a pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, and there's some data, it, it, again, relatively mixed, but there are three randomized trials, uh, several prospective trials and retrospective. Um, as far as risk of biochemical recurrence, most of them actually show no difference. Uh, and also in metastasis-free survival, overall survival, and some increase in risk of lymphocele. Um, there are some trials going on now with standard versus extended. Again, there's, there may be some difference in biochemical recurrence um, uh, or other longer term survival, but it does come with uh, risks 
is probably more for again for that local control when those men come in with bulky lymphadenopathy after surgery you have to increase your radiation field and more likely to have metastasis in, in uh, uh, more distant areas as far as post-operative surgery for the uh, uh, radiation uh, for the most part there is a benefit compared to wait and watch um, but it's really only for biochemical recurrence um, it does not uh, improve overall survival. But for men with adverse features, such as seminal vesicle invasion, extracapsular extension, margins, uh, we do use that. But again, that's where those post-operative tests that decipher Polaris come into play. Um, I'm gonna zip through these, but um, the, I'm actually gonna go ahead and skip that. So this is what we have to consider. Do we give ADT and for how long? Do we combine with brachytherapy uh, for men whose prostate is in place, whole pelvic radiation and hyperfractionation? So we should all be familiar with the BOLA trial. There is benefit of radiation uh, with the addition of ADT. Uh, this was uh, out to three years, although if you look at the trial, only about uh, 50 to 60% of men actually made it that far. Um, and then uh, duration does make a difference. So this, this curve is actually flipped. That's a, a percent mortality is the y-axis. So the higher that curve, the greater the risk. So this is long-term androgen deprivation. Um, Lost my, I lost my pointer here. So this is long-term. So actually lower mortality when that uh, uh, androgen deprivation is at least a year and a half. So that's why the NCCN guideline says one to three years for it versus short-term, which is six months with associated with higher mortality. Uh, you can combine with brachytherapy. It does improve progression-free survival, but not necessarily overall survival, but again, comes with toxicity, rectal toxicity, bleeding, um, sexual function, urinary function. Whole pelvic radiation, 10-year um, overall survival uh, and event-free survival is actually similar, but when they did a post hoc analysis, there was a benefit uh, if the um, uh, risk of lymph node involvement was actually less than 15%, so actually lower, a little bit lower risk disease. So these men with maybe micrometastatic disease, those men might have a little bit of benefit. As far as hyperfractionation, I don't know if that shows up well, but those curves are really close. Um, and that, that uh, there's really no difference. So hyperfractionation is not superior to conventional as far as five-year relapse-free survival and overall survival. So right now there is a trial going on, SWOG 1802. It's uh, being headed by Brian Chapin at uh, MD Anderson. This is the only phase three trial looking at uh, systemic therapy versus definitive therapy. There's, there's about eight other uh, phase two or sort of uh, uh, prospective cohort trials, but this is only um, phase three randomized trial. And it's systemic therapy, usually androgen deprivation, plus or minus uh, docetaxel with definitive surgery or with or without definitive surgery or radiation. Um, they're looking to accrue uh, 1,273 patients and they're gonna finish uh, by 2031. So it's a little bit of a slow accrual, mostly because men are having to decide, you know, uh, that surgery versus just androgen deprivation. Uh, they need to get staging and uh, have uh, obviously biopsy confirmed. And then the primary outcome for this one is overall survival. So this is, it's a relatively prolonged trial, but at least for these high risk and very high risk men, you don't need that 20 year outlook like a, a screened population. Um, and then they're also looking at local progression and, and some other secondary outcomes. So this is a pretty exciting trial. We're participating at Vanderbilt. I, I think y'all have it here at Wisconsin. I have to ask Dave, but um, so that is, that's that. So uh, just to wrap up, leave some time for questions. So uh, uh, patients with high risk disease should be offered sort of an array of therapies, including either surgery or radiation, but understand that a lot of these men do need systemic therapy uh, either uh, in, a, in a new adjuvant setting or adjuvantly. Um, those who do have surgery should go pelvic lymph node dissection if they are uh, greater than 2% risk uh, with early salvage radiation for those with biochemical recurrence. And we can include that ultra-sensitive PSA to risk stratify. Um, those who have radiation should have androgen deprivation. Try to at least get them to a year and a half. You can do brachy boost and hyperfractionation, but again, that, that doesn't necessarily come without some risks. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time and happy to take questions.
Thank you, Dr. Moses. That was really fantastic. Um, uh, I'll maybe start off the questions, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, would you be able to define, especially for this audience, um, what active surveillance is sure. and how is it implemented and how has it changed in terms of the frequency of utilization over the last decade? Definitely. So active surveillance we use for men with uh, low risk disease. So meaning Gleason 6, PSA less than 10, and a normal exam or, or at most a small nodule. And some centers will even include favorable intermediate risk if it's majority Gleason 3. Um, and have had some other biochemical tests. So for those men, uh, they've had their initial biopsy. You wanna get a confirmatory biopsy, ideally with an MRI if they haven't already had it, usually within six to 12 months. Uh, and that, again, confirmatory, so make sure they just have low risk disease. And then follow with PSAs usually uh, every six months and then repeat biopsy at a year. And then if that biopsy is stable, you can stretch it out to two years, three years. Um, there's been tremendous uptake. I mean, it, when it was first proposed probably 15, 20 years ago by uh, the group in Toronto and then in Hopkins, and they were almost laughed out of the room. Again, as surgeons, we were operating on everybody at the time. So why would we give up surgery? Uh, but over time, it's picked up. And so now I think it's about 50 to 60 percent are uh, getting active surveillance, whereas not even five or 10 years ago, it was less than 25 percent. And uh, so again, so for that long term, about two thirds of men can avoid definitive treatment for up to 10 years. So they're living with their diagnosis of cancer, but also maintaining their quality of life. So that, that's, that's a really important thing. And again, that, that part of the reason USPSTF upgraded is you take into account the uptake of active surveillance. That's how many men are avoiding therapy. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Very nice presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the role of more um, advanced imaging, for example. Now, PSMA PET is approved for even the initial diagnosis kind of staging and stuff. How does that play a role in, in the treatment selection or staging the patients more accurately? So I, that's a great question. I'll use it in two settings. So in the localized a positive PSMA is great, especially if it's just the prostate or you see one lymph node, because then you know going for definitive therapy has a benefit. The sensitivity of PSMA PET is actually relatively poor. I'm not recalling the number right now, but it's actually not a great negative test. And that was from a study uh, in Europe where they did PSMAs on everybody that was going towards surgery. And they found about a 10 to 20% risk of cancer in the intermediate and high risk groups. Now, uh, so that it is, so for that, for localized, it's great. Where it's really changed is the men that we're treating with what is called M0 CRPC. The, the, so the castrate resistant prostate cancer with no evidence of metastasis. What, was no, what used to be considered a very large window of men is quickly narrowing because we're getting PSMAs and we're seeing little dots in places that aren't being picked up by conventional imaging. So uh, if you've ever sat in on an ad board um, I've, they, I've sat in on an ad board for, specifically for M0 CRPC, and I've told them, I was like, that might not be a great investment because that population is, is rapidly shrinking with these better tests that are coming along. Um, the other thing that PSMA is really useful for um, are for the, the uh, theranostics, so the lutetium, the radium therapy, when you're trying to target some, some areas, uh, we, we're utilizing PSMA a lot. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Carrie Wazinski with Hemonc. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts about circulating tumor DNA or cell-free DNA, both in the screening world, but also kind of maybe for decision makings about high-risk localized disease and who potentially might not benefit from more aggressive therapies because they're somewhat destined to develop metastatic disease? Yeah, that's an exciting area. And if you can get it, it's great, right? So it, you know, if, if you have availability, I think it's great. I, you know, in the screening uh, population, I'm not sure that's going to be the greatest utility um, because, it, it, you know, I don't know how much they're shedding into the bloodstream just directly from the prostate. Where I think it's going to be very helpful is kind of like you said, the people who are post-definitive therapy, um, if you've measured it before and after and you don't see a significant drop in that circulating tumor volume, those are the people who should 
uh, probably get aggressive therapy early on, especially if, in younger men. You know, I'm thinking like the 55 year old guy that comes in with a four plus three and maybe had a positive note or a positive margin. Um, those men, we should probably treat a lot earlier. The other uh, I, where I see it are in the very advanced men, the MCRPC, and you're in your second and third line. If you can get that uh, circulating tumor DNA from that, that can guide your therapy decision making. So, uh, you know, in the screening population, not so much, but in that high risk, localized pre and post treatment, and then the men at the far end, I think that's where you're going to see the, the greatest utility. But again, then again, the availability and cost is going to have to come down. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So with the caveat that I'm a critical care physician, so I actually don't think about prostate cancer <laughs> screening a lot. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the disparities in screening for Black men and the higher burden of disease in Black men. And you also mentioned, if I caught this right, that um, the fusion protein, the screening was less uh, um, a sensitive or less, uh, less commonly it's seen less in prevalent. Black men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is the increased disease burden simply a uh, um, reflection of decreased screening? Is it is it different mechanism of disease, or, or you know, is there a biological basis for any of this? And what your thoughts are, and how to fix it? Um, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, it's 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 a combination. So I'll give you the data driven, and then I'll give you my personal feeling. And I already said, you know, forget your feelings, but I'm going to give you my feeling. So. The data driven, so uh, black men, so screen less, and I've gotten into arguments. They're like, well, if they're screened less, how are they being diagnosed more? Well, what, what's happening is their screening happens at the time of diagnosis, right? So it, it's, it's uh, and, then, and then if you have never been screened, you're more likely to show up with this higher grade disease. Um, is it genetics? You, if, if you took my genes and Hamid's and Paloma's, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between us other than the X and Y's. But uh, uh, my feeling is that the epigenetic difference is gonna play a huge role. And I think there's a lot of people, I had a good discussion yesterday. Um, I think that's gonna make a difference. The other difference, if you look at gen genomic testing uh, or genomic sort of screening things like TCGA and things like that, the actual number, absolute value of genetic differences is not different between white and black and any other ethnicity. But uh, Walter Rafer just published a study, the, the types of genes that are different is different. And I'm, I'll talk about this at noon in the sport talk, but in black men, it tends to be more like the pro-inflammatory cytokine sort of inflammatory genes Whereas in white men, it tends to be like cell cycle and DNA repair genes where you see the differences. And part of the reason uh, platinum-based chemotherapy works better in white men, I'm thinking is because it's that DNA repair gene um, where they're getting that benefit. Whereas the pro-inflammatory like lipoprotein and things like that. So there may be some subtle differences, particularly for men with more advanced disease. But as far as the survival difference, the data shows that black men are less likely to be screened and less likely to be treated regardless of risk. And so that is the hugest difference. So we can, we can talk all day about genes, but that slice of the pie is real small. If you, don't, if you make up the gap in treatment, you can almost close that mortality difference. Yeah. Maybe I, I'm up here, I don't wanna follow up just a little bit real quickly on Dr. Schnapp's question around what do we do to fix this? Um, at USBSDF makes national recommendations. Um, however, there's region specific differences. So if we go back to 2009, 2010, the state of Wisconsin ranked about 25th for overall survival for men with prostate cancer diagnosis. Um, the latest data in 2019 has us ranked at 41st in the country for overall survival. And based on trends, we're expecting the updated data is gonna put us probably around 45th in the country for survival. So we are one of the worst states in the nation for prostate cancer diagnoses. So how do we fix this? Thank God for Mississippi, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there are regional differences in, 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 in treatment and screening. Um, the, the Southeast and apparently Wisconsin, um, <laughs> Uh, there's a, there is a treatment gap, obviously, and so we we the you can screen all day, but then if you can't get in the door for 
what that screening test meant or explain what it is, then you've, you've sort of hit a wall. So that, I, I, ooh, sorry, personally, I've stopped doing like these screening fairs where like a hundred men show up and get the PSA and you send them a letter because then it dropped, the ball has been dropped. And then, you know, I'm a health literacy guy. So the guy that gets there, he's like, what does NG slash ML mean? And what is the greater than 1000? Like, so it, 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 it's a multi-step thing. It can be addressed. So the state of California, uh, Mark Litwin, who's the chair of urology at UCLA, went to the legislature um, and presented the numbers. And he said, black and Hispanic men, particularly in Southern California, are dying from prostate cancer. There's just this tremendous gap. And he said, if we have funding for screening and at least initial treatment and first follow-up, we can close that gap. And he got funding for it. And then they tracked it. And if you read, it's called the impact trial, but they, the studies, that, that curve, it was a very sharp difference. And it only took about six or seven years to start seeing that difference because so many of those men were coming in with either metastatic or high-risk disease. And so when you saw that gap narrow, now again, that's California, right? That's like a liberal bastion and, you know, That'll never fly in Tennessee. If I go there, they'll probably censor me and kick me out, right? Because they did it before. Uh, but it, that's what it takes. I mean, it, it's politics and money, you know? Like, that's that's what it is. You already asked a question, so I'm going to go to Ron first. Uh, and then we'll come back to you. Loud, I don't know. <laughs> so that was a great talk. I really appreciate it. And I, and I absolutely agree that genetically we're very similar, blah, blah, blah. But obviously there's a lot of other things that are different. You know, epigenetics sounds interesting, but is this one disease? What about, you mentioned the amount of um, inflammatory that some people have. Uh, can you comment on, there's some data that I'm not super familiar with that um, HPV, for example, is more common in people with metastatic disease. Um, can you comment on other infectious etiologies? Yeah, that, so the the data on infectious etiology is relatively weak. So the um, the Southern Community Cohort Study, SCCS, did an HPV study, and there was like a slight signal in prostate cancer. I don't know if it was strong enough to sort of uh, generalize that. Um, I did a study uh, back when I was a resident looking at uh, inflammatory markers, including like LDL, sort of that cholesterol pathway. And those men were more likely to be diagnosed with higher uh, grade on biopsy. That was, that was my population. Um, and then the black men tended to have like a higher LDL. Um, as the only black man in this room, I can tell you it's a little bit inflammatory being a black man in the US. And, uh, and, and I'm in a relatively well-off position. Um, so I can tell you that uh, my patients that come from North Nashville who have to fight uh, the police and the school and the the housing authority and whoever else. I mean, they're stressed, right? Like, and a, a talk that I give, like, disparities don't happen in a vacuum. And what I see in prostate is the same thing we see in breast, which is the same thing we see in colon, the same thing we see in thyroid lung. So we are not genetically inferior. So that's why I always say we can't rely on genes because otherwise you have to say that we are just like these genetic mutants, which we're not, I can guarantee you that. And so then you, again, it goes back to what, what are the environmental aspects that play into this? What are the uh, lifestyle, dietary? Um, I can tell you that this used to be a lot larger. Josh, right? Um, <laughs> No idea what this, you're talking this, about. This, 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 this. Um, and so in the South, uh, and again, maybe in Wisconsin, you know, cheese, dairy. Um, so th that plays a role. And especially uh, um, obesity. So some of the pro-inflammatory markers associated with obesity. Number one, obesity washes out PSA. So it lowers the threshold of what is quote unquote positive. But again, you're, you're more likely, an uh, obese man has increased aromatase that's shunted to estrogen. If you're going to form a cancer in a low testosterone environment, it's actually much worse, right? And so again, you're you're right. There there are some uh, aspects of it beyond purely genetics, and maybe even epigenetics that that play a role in that. We're going to end with one last question from online, and this is a practical question. So um, actually, these are 
this is reflects two patients that I saw in clinic this week. Um, 75 year old gentleman who presents with metastatic disease. Um, and how do you recommend screening for his younger siblings as well as his grandchildren? Okay. So it, for a first degree relative, the risk of prostate cancer doubles. Um, it's, it, the risk is even higher if someone is diagnosed with metastatic disease. What I would recommend is uh, for his sons and grandsons start screening at age 40. For his wife or daughters and granddaughters get their breast and ovarian testing because BRCA is associated with higher risk cancer. Um, so I would get gen genetic testing in those men. Now for that man at 75, I'm gonna look at his health status and say, okay, well, is it three plus four, majority three, is this Polaris negative? I'm gonna, I probably will watch him because he's probably not gonna die from prostate cancer. But for the family, I would escalate that, that screening and genetic testing. We are at time.